But this is dedicated, this lecture to uh, Charles Carpenter. Among other names, we used to fondly call him the tall man. <clears throat> uh, Chuck was uh, an enormous presence. He came to us from Johns Hopkins and, and, and really put into place many of the principles that we still follow here. Uh, I was his last chief resident, and that was only for about three months before he moved to Brown. Uh, but he was chair of medicine, as mentioned. Among other things, uh, Chuck did uh, incredible research on cholera and delineated the mechanisms through which the diarrhea occurred and worked in Bangladesh to do that. But he had an enormous influence on many of us. And uh, as I said before, uh, many of us uh, emulate our careers based upon his influence, et cetera. So it's great to see everybody here. And um, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce our speaker today. That is <clears throat> Jerry Elner. Jerry preceded me here as chief of infectious diseases uh, for many years. I think he started in 72, uh, went on to become interim chair of medicine for uh, a short while, and then went on to uh, New Jersey, where he still is a professor and actively working. He is renowned for his work in tuberculosis and uh, will share some of that with us today. His title uh, of his address is The Known Knowns and the Known Unknowns, a real mouthful, but uh, I think it's important for us to understand what we do know and what we don't. Uh, with that, Jerry, please uh, thank you for doing this and it's great to have you. Thank you, uh, Bob and the organizing committee, which may just be Bob for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor. I feel like I've come home. I know so many of you. Some of you I haven't seen in 30, 40 years, but still, uh, we go on. Um, let's see if I can advance my slides. So um, I began studying tuberculosis when I was say I was recruited to case by Chuck Carpenter, but in fact, I recruited myself. I knew him at Johns Hopkins. Um, I wrote to him, said I was interested in a position. And he said, sight unseen, jury, come here. We have a job for you. So I did. 47 years ago, I began to study tuberculosis. And I'm still at it. I haven't figured it all out. And today I'd like to talk about uh, the progress that's been made and, and also what the areas that we think need more attention. So tuberculosis is very much in front of the world in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Keats wrote about the youth who's pale and specter thin and died. It was called the white plague because individuals became pale. 20% of Europe would die of tuberculosis, probably more because we didn't have a good diagnostic ability. In 1882, Koch discovered the tuberculosis, bacillus, and the best investigators of that era were drawn to the study of tuberculosis. And there's great advances, a tuberculin skin test, um, BCG vaccine, for what it's worth, which is something, et cetera, et cetera, and then streptonizin and isoniazid. That was in 1882. 111 years later, the WHO, not sure if I can get rid of that, but WHO declared uh, TB as a global public health emergency. Now, how could this be? And I think the, the, the answer is complicated. Um, when drugs became available, people thought we could cure TB. Problem is over. Short course chemotherapy was six months didn't address the fact that people won't take the drug when they're feeling better and there's toxicity, et cetera. And, but basically the thought was that TB was not an American problem because it wasn't occurring here. 95% of cases uh, occurred in low and middle income countries and no lesser personage than Tony Fauci came to case to visit and talk to my fellow Bob Wallace and said, what are you doing? And Bob said, TB research. And Tony said, 
why? Okay. <laughs> and uh, things changed with HIV, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the world has begun to recognize there's no such thing as a, a problem in Africa and Asia that's not a, a US problem. Um, now, as opposed to this lack of vision, we have uh, Chuck Carpenter. Uh, Chuck was a person of amazing vision. He was a born leader, very charismatic, taciturn with a dry sense of humor, but a commanding presence in, in, in any room and an outstanding clinician. But most of all, he was a great advocate for his students, residents, house staff, fellows, and faculty. And it was a great joy to work with him in the early days of the Department of Medicine. Now, there are hundreds of anecdotes I could tell you, and I've told many of them previously, but I wanted to focus today on his accomplishments. Um, so tuberculosis wasn't felt to be a global, an American problem. Chuck founded the first division of geographic medicine in the world. Um, there were those who said at the time that infectious disease was an un unnecessary specialty uh, before HIV and, and SARS and COVID. And, um, but Chuck wanted to develop infectious disease. And the way he did this was through his leadership. Our best residents wanted to be our fellows. Our best fellows, our best house staff wanted to be like Chuck. They wanted to train infectious diseases. And we had in our laboratory the best of that generation of fellows at Case, including Keith Armitage. <laughs> and, uh, but we couldn't keep up so a lot of long and Michael Letterman and Charlie King and many of the current faculty. Bob Bonomo was a fellow uh, with us. I may have missed a few in the room, but it was a, a halcyon time and between infectious disease and geographic medicine, uh, we put together a case on the global map. But he did more than this. He was all about equity and social justice. He integrated a private service and a staff service at a time that was not being done in many places and a move that wasn't necessarily popular with hospital leadership. He also integrated divisions across UH and VA and Metro, later Metro. And he recruited Roddy Cox to be chief of medicine at the VA, outstanding academic leader. And all of us spent time rotating at the VA as well as at UH to the betterment of both services. And then in 1984 or so, he called me, I was out of town and said, you know, there's HIV. I'm not even sure it was called HIV. I think it was uh, the seminal deficiency out there. I think we should have a special immunology unit at Case. And I said, what did Michael say? And Michael was interested. And we were in an area of low prevalence. We didn't see many HIV infected. And the hospital leadership said to me, we don't want to be known as the AIDS hospital, but Chuck was the chair of medicine, special immunology unit endures and succeeds, thanks to Bob and, and others, BARB and others. And uh, he did that. His division chiefs became department chairs, they became deans. One of them, Dick Golds, became a president of a university, a medical school. Um, and I think ultimately, Case became an academic powerhouse. And remind you, that he left in 1985 and things have blossomed since then. I think it's a, the mark of an academic leader that if they leave, things don't fall apart. Uh, and they moved to Brown, Brown and his, what he did completely changed. When he was at UH, he sat in his office and he tried to work through all the complexities of running an academic department. At Brown, he made a fundamental personal commitment to care for HIV infected women and prisoners. And Brown became a leading university uh, in, in those populations. He became director of a center for AIDS research and continued it until he was about 82 years old. He chaired national committees on HIV. 
and Brown became an academic powerhouse. So there's a lesson here. So let me tell you about tuberculosis. So in 2019, tuberculosis was a leading cause of death due to an identifiable infectious disease. And of course, beyond that, uh, COVID took over for a year or two, but I think tuberculosis uh, will remain up there. And it is a disease that occurs low in, in, in low and middle income countries. If you take Pakistan, India, and Philippines, that's two thirds of the cases in the world because of the population masses there. If you look at the other uh, named countries on this map, uh, you get up to, uh, let's see. Can someone show me how to use the pointer? Sorry. Um, you, you get up to 87% um, of the cases in the world. Now, on the other hand, I know what you did, but there it is. And on the other hand, if you look at the incidence, so the rate of disease, it, it remains highest in Southern South and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa because of the overlap um, with HIV. And there are trends. And much as uh, HIV had a profound effect on tuberculosis control, in fact, COVID had a different type of effect, not because of immunodeficiency, but because services to care for TB patients were abandoned. People were pulled into COVID clinical work and research and laboratories, happened here, happened everywhere in the world. Uh, patients with TB were afraid to come to the hospital. So as a result, there's a lag, and there are more cases now occurring of tuberculosis and more deaths, 500,000 excess deaths due to TB attributed to delays in diagnosis and treatment related to COVID. I'd like to point out this amazing relationship between poverty and TB. Um, in fact, the, the incidence of tuberculosis correlates well with the prevalence of undernutrition in a population. And there are other risk factors but none compares with malnutrition, none contain, compares with poverty, making it genuinely a disease of the underserved, for sure. So today I'd like to go through some of what we know about tuberculosis with a few updates. Natural history, pathogenesis, epidemiology. So tuberculosis, of course, 95% of cases is pulmonary restricted to the upper lobes and the posterior basal segments of the low lobes, apical basal segments of the, uh, uh, of the upper lobes. And, and most clinicians can look at the uh, x-ray and make a diagnosis, particularly in the endemic area. But if we go beyond that to, set t to PET CT scans, where you look at inflammatory foci, you find that in addition to what you see on x-ray, there are multiple additional inflammatory foci in the lung, and they're not static. Some of them grow larger and some of them grow smaller, even during the course of therapy. So there's a lot going on, much more diffuse damage than you would otherwise expect. Of course, granulomas are the hallmark of tuberculosis with caseation. And when people cough, there's aerosolization of infectious particles. Uh, now, we used to think that cough, it was all about coughing and sneezing, talking loud. But in fact, recent studies from South Africa suggest that tidal breathing is enough to lead to transmission. Cough is still more efficient per moment you're coughing, but tidal breathing is, is sufficient. And of course, the acid is, uh was a diagnostic uh, of choice until things changed recently. We're about that. So the story is that we have a couple of million, we have 10 million cases, a couple of million deaths, but a huge reservoir of people with TB infection. And we thought that TB infection, you know, we tell people in TB, like you have sleeping TB, you know, it's there, but it's not, not doing much. But in fact, that may not be so. So in studies we've done in South Africa, 
we have patients with a GONE complex, of, you know, healed primary TB. But if you look at household contacts of TB patients and do PET-CTCNs, you see about 12 to 15% of them have inflammatory parenchymal lesions. So they're clinically well, you know, chest X-ray doesn't show much, but they have an active lesion, whether you call it subclinical TB or not. We'll come back to that. So more and more, we talk about early tuberculosis and maybe a continuum between exposure, infection, and progression to disease. So one of the recent advances, diagnostics. In uh, 2009, uh, David Land at Rutgers uh, developed the Cepheid platform as a diagnostic for uh, tuberculosis. And this has swept through the world and has become the primary way to diagnose TB in countries such as South Africa with its huge burden. And then there were improvements made. The Expert Ultra, where you amplify not just a single gene, but multi-gene copies is more sensitive and gives you rifampin resistance uh, as well as diagnosis of TB. And you can modify this using molecular beacons to come up with drug susceptibility tests for tuberculosis. Uh, so within, within a few hours, you can determine someone has tuberculosis and what the drug susceptibility test reveals. And this is being used as a standard at reference laboratories in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in, in Asia. So remarkable advances in TB, but there's more that needs to be done. We'll come back to that. Vaccines. There's a fusion protein, M72, subunit vaccine in a potent adjuvant that can fit almost 60% protection against development of adult tuberculosis in high prevalence countries. And needless to say, uh, people are scrambling to do additional studies of this vaccine and other vaccines. Even BCG revaccination has been some potential as a TB vaccine. We're glad to talk about that more in the discussion. Um, how do you treat latent TB infection? One month of rifapentine plus isoniazid is sufficient to prevent HIV-related tuberculosis. Down to one month, now there are studies trying to chip away, make it two weeks of treatment. Um, how long do you need to treat? For the first time in this uh, important study, a four-month regimen of rifapentine, uh, with or without moxifloxacin, uh, was effective. Um, so we were down to four months of treatment. And the changes were even more dramatic in multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. So this was the uh, this was the former regimen, twenty four months of a lot of drugs, including injectables, and now the WHO has endorsed a six month course of bedaquiline, pertominid, linezolid, and moxifloxacin. So instead of that, you get that for six months. Um, these are new and potent drugs. And there are trials ongoing, and John Johnson can tell you about them, to, to look at their activity in drug-susceptible TB. And I think it's highly likely, if you come back in a few years, we'll have a two-month regimen for the treatment of active TB, maybe a one-month regimen. And this will have some impact on the global public health problem. So the known unknowns. And these are areas that we know are important, but we don't really know what they mean and how to evaluate them thoroughly. thoroughly. One is a subclinical TB. And some people talk about asymptomatic TB. Maybe the best definition is that you don't have enough symptoms to come to a physician to seek a diagnosis and treatment. Uh, on the other hand, or more often than not, there's some symptom that this just doesn't reach the level of uh, care seeking. So in uh, 2005, some of us, 
you may remember Eddie Jones and of course Chris Whalen uh, talked about the fact that people were thinking of subclinical TB as a new entity, but it wasn't. In early studies in Uganda, uh, Chris found that if someone in the household has TB, within the next month or two, you see people who are initially asymptomatic who develop symptoms. So at baseline, you would have said they're asymptomatic, but in a few months, they become symptomatic. So there's that. What we didn't realize at the time is how frequent this is. Um, so a bunch of surveys in Asia and Africa, 50% of cases of TB that you find by active case finding, where you do chest x-rays on everyone and you do bacteriology in those with abnormal chest x-ray, one half the cases are subclinical. You know, we, we had a conference in which we, we played the name game <laughs> and there was some discussion with this could be called asymptomatic or subclinical, but it's being called subclinical. So it's common. And then the next question is, well, is it important? One of the uh, fascinating propositions uh, which came out of the University of Washington was, was a model of tuberculosis, not yet totally proved, where you have latent infection, so you're, you're infected. And some people eliminate the infection. Some go on and they just remain positive on tuberculous skin test or agra for quite a period of time. But others uh, reactivate and a larger number may go through a cycling of disease where at some time they're positive in terms of bacteriology and then they become negative and then they become positive and they may ultimately become symptomatic or remain subclinical. So this really captured the imagination, you know, and it's still kind of an issue. If you saw, find subclinical TB, do you need to treat it? And recent studies from the pre chemotherapy era, era suggest that about 40% of individuals will develop active TB and maybe an equal number never will, okay? So, we have some of the first evidence of uh, persistence and cycling of subclinical TB. This is from the same study of household contacts of TB, multi-drug TB patient, uh, TB patients with multi-drug resistant TB in South Africa. PET CT scan uh, at baseline shows active lesions, uh, some of them dramatic. Patients are cultured, they have no symptoms, three induced sputum are negative um, bacteriologically. So they have, if they have some clinical TB, it's now being called non-infectious. At least it's bacteriologically negative. Six months later, you know, some individuals still have lesions. Uh, 12 months later, they do as well. But eventually, uh, cultures become positive. Now it's a little complicated because these late cases could be reinfection. South Africa has an enormous burden of TB. It's different from almost anywhere else in the world. But there's no, what we found that ultimately of those with parenchymal lesions on PET CT scans that look like tuberculosis, about there were 12% who were in that category, one half of them develop culture, positive cultures during the first two years. And they develop positive cultures, but they're still asymptomatic. So there's the rub. Uh, why is it subclinical TB important? Well, in this modeling, it may be that when you have clinical TB and you're coughing up a lot of these red snappers, you're highly infectious. There's no question that smear positive uh, cases are more infectious. In fact, subclinical TB may be smear positive, but still the idea is the subclinical phase may be more prolonged. So a greater period in which there may be transmission. And obviously the ultimate control of TB in the world would be to interrupt transmission, not to try to manage 
the complications of the disease. So uh, there is clear evidence now from community studies in KwaZulu Natal that subclinical TB can transmit. We don't know that it transmits as well as clinical TB, but bacteriologically, there's not a lot of difference in the number of organisms. It's not really pussy bacillary TB, as you might see in pediatric TB, and not inherently infectious. So probably these individuals are infectious. Um, okay. So that subclinical TB need more work. We need a way to screen asymptomatics because the, the problem with this is around the world in TB control programs, you go into high risk individuals and contacts and you say, are you symptomatic or not? And if you can be asymptomatic and have disease, that's not adequate. So what are we gonna do? WHO recommends sputum expert for all, but this is impractical, probably won't happen, right? Incipient TB. So incipient TB is a little uh, will the wisp. So today you're well, your chest x-ray is normal. If you make sputum, the cultures are negative. You know, maybe if you do a PET CT scan, there's not a lot going on. But in a few months, you're going to develop tuberculosis, active TB. So we, we have this month re one month regimen now for prevention of TB with drugs. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just use it in the people at risk of progression rather than in everyone? So ultimately, if we treat 100 people with who are tuberculin skin test positive with preventive therapy, we protect not five of them or so from developing TB. The rest had no risk, and they're exposed to these drugs, which are potentially uh, lead to serious adverse effects. So incipient TB. But what seemed to be a landmark paper was published in 2016. And what it did was it, it took an adolescent cohort at high risk in South Africa and did repeated blood draws and look at gene expression, transcriptional signatures. And it came up with a 16 gene signature. And the red, the red tells, you know, blacks tell if you had the signature. So in those who are going to develop tuberculosis within the next six months, most of them develop had a signature. It sold the, the ACS core signature. But as you get further from the period in which you're going to develop tuberculosis, the signature loses sensitivity. Now, my thinking, of course, I was envious that someone else had come up with this first because we were trying to study it. My thinking is that these individuals already have subclinical TB. And this is just a diagnosis, diagnostic for subclinical TB rather than for incipient TB. So what they did, um, I would say this was bold, but you know what that means to me is maybe it's ethically questionable, uh, but they did this in South Africa. And what they did was they, they took high-risk individuals who are agro positive, if you had this risk 11 is a subset of the risk six, of the 16 gene signature. If you were risk 11 positive, you're randomized to rifapentine versus not. And if you're risk 11 negative, you got nothing. And it turned out that the trial was disappointing. There were very few endpoints. The, the finding of the signature, which is really a signature of inflammatory genes, or rather than which suggests some degree of active replicating foci. Um, the final signature told you someone had TB at that moment, co-prevalent TB, or they were going to develop TB within the next six months. But preventive therapy was ineffective in, in them. Now, the thinking, and I'm not sure I agree with this, and John might comment about some of our early studies in Uganda, the thinking was that they had subclinical TB and the preventive therapy regimen wasn't enough. You know, it's hard to believe for pentanoids and is a pretty good combination. Um, so 
this was a little bit disappointing and, and set us back on our heels. Now, of course, uh, my the group I work with at Rutgers has a different signature. <laughs> and this uh, comes from a longstanding collaboration. We began when I was a case in Vitoria, Brazil, where we've had the opportunity to follow contact, also contacts for five to 10 years. And what we found is PREDICT29, which I named because it had 29 genes involved, uh, clearly differentiated those who had developed tuberculosis from those who would not, but it predicted not just a short-term risk, but a long-term risk. So half the cases occurred uh, more than two years after the index case. And the genes were of interest because they weren't inflammatory genes, they were genes related to the immune response and the antigen presentation. So of course we're interested in following this up with other studies to validate this and are trying to do so in an African population. Um, long TB. So tuberculosis is associated with immune activation. Not a surprise. Um, one of the studies from CASE, which involved Sarah Tusi and others that you may know, uh, showed that there's generalized immune activation systemically uh, in pulmonary TB, and even more so when there was TB and HIV. And coupling this with several studies that have shown excess mortality in individuals with uh, tuberculosis, even after treatment, it suggests that tuberculosis and immune activation leads to consequences unrelated to the infection uh, per se. Now, um, another finding is, I mean, I used to think, and after 47 years, I often get this wrong, I used to think you treat a person with tuberculosis, it's over, they're cured, you can go home. But in fact, in the so-called catalysis study, if you look six months after the diagnosis of treatment, uh, the, the diagnosis and treatment of TB, at the end of treatment, 86% of individuals have inflammatory foci and PET CT scans. And a year later, uh, it's still 46%. So it seems, and, and these people are not going to relapse, but the inflammatory response extends long beyond the uh, period of treatment, in some if not all. Now, another study said, what about LTBI? And they showed evidence on flow cytometry that individuals with a positive IGRA, these are HIV infected as well, also have evidence of immune activation. These not individuals necessarily recently exposed, we don't know duration of the latent TB infection. Of course, I'd be remiss in pointing out that two of our early uh, Infectious disease fellows at Case, uh, Steve Bass and Phil Spagnuolo and I showed in 1981 that there was evidence for an activating factor in plasma of individuals uh, known to have had tuberculosis in the uh, Cleveland area and also in individuals with LTBI. So there's immune activation. And what does that do? Well, the persistent inflammatory response leads to lung damage. Again, no surprise, particularly as we often see in Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa, people with very extensive tuberculosis, there's lung damage. There's cavitation, there's lung damage. But if you look at the numbers, there's a lot. So 50% of TB patients are showing impaired lung function uh, at the end of treatment. And there's no question that tuberculosis contributes to COPD and to increase mortality from respiratory disease. And bronchiectasis may be a factor um, in what goes on. But I think the lesson of long COVID and, and maybe of chronic fatigue syndrome is, is, is that you can't have an infectious disease and it can, can, tri can trigger multi-system 
symptoms after the infectious agent is gone, maybe through a common pathway or not. For example, in a study of coronary artery disease, uh, patients with tuberculosis have an increased risk of uh, coronary artery disease, and this is uh, the probability of being free. And I did a study, recent study published, a study recently published from Peru, showing the risk of acute myocardial infarction was increased with prior tuberculosis. So the, the TB may affect the heart. And uh, I'd like to just point to what I think to be a very important study that's ongoing by Friedrich Thienemann in uh, South Africa. So this is a study of Simvastin as a host-directed ther therapy to quell inflammation at the end of TB treatment. So Friedrich, um, so let's uh, take individuals at the end of treatment and do a PET-CT scan and also do a cardiac MRI, MRI. So what he found, similar to the earlier study in Cape Town, was 40% of individuals at the end of TB treatment had lung inflammation. But the interesting thing was there were associated functional and anatomic different and functional defects in, in cardiac uh, muscle. And over 65% of participants had either fibrosis or inflammation of the myocardial of myocardium on cardiac MRI. So this raises the question of whether uh, tuberculosis may predispose individuals to either coronary artery disease or to uh, cardiomyopathy. And if you begin to count up the chronic disease sequelae of tuberculosis, you know, you get into a different position. If you think of TB as an infectious disease, that's bad, you treat it, there's transmission, that's bad, you try to deal with it. But if this really shortens survival and has chronic sequelae, I think it maybe increases the ante in terms of early diagnosis coming up with host-directed therapy to modify the inflammatory response, et cetera. I, I've also been interested in the neurologic consequences of tuberculosis. So there are about 2,600 studies of pulmonary impairment after TB. I found two studies looking at central neuro nervous system issues after TB, one of them showing an increased risk of stroke and the other showing an increased risk of dementia. So, I mean, the world is, only, is not only about tuberculosis, but I think we need to pay attention and maybe uh, think through whether we need to intervene because of chronic disease sequelae. So uh, what do we need now to bring the known unknowns within the known knowns. <laughs> we need a screening strategy for subclinical TB. People are getting excited about doing tongue swabs. It's not very as sensitive as culture, but it's easy to do, particularly in healthy populations that don't spontaneously produce sputum. We need a biomarker for recipient TB. It'd be nice to think one of the biomarkers out there, like PREDICT29 or IT, but it may be more complicated that, than that. And we need understanding and a way to prevent the long-term consequences of TB. Now, to address these, uh, I think we need a global network. So there are so many studies of tuberculosis in India or in China or in Peru, but you know, there are regional differences in the organism and the, the genetics of the organism and the host, and they, it matters a lot. So if we're really gonna study tuberculosis, we have to have clinical endpoints rather than surrogates. So we want to find individuals, we wanna find a predictor who's gonna uh, develop TB. We need thousands. If you wanna find a predictor of treatment failure, we need large cohorts and we need them across the world. We also need intensive studies at single sites. So I'll show you what we're up to at uh, Rutgers which I think is complementary to the enormous uh, tuberculosis program at CASE. We have, fortunately, we have several uh, large NIH-funded studies 
which allow us to look at diagnostics in pediatrics as well as in adults and to study basic issues in uh, progression of TB and bacterial mechanism of tolerance. And I'm more involved recently in what's called the Report International uh, Network. This is a, a network that's been set up by NIH across, uh, at this point, eight countries, high burden countries, where we're enrolling TB cases, pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB, drug sensitive, drug resistant, and we're including in this uh, a standard, uh, we call common protocol of data standards and laboratory standards, so that studies can be compared across the sites. And I'm, I'm pleased that most recently we've added uh, Uganda to the list of report countries. And, uh, and hopefully we really would like to add Peru and uh, Vietnam. But it's a very ambitious program and success is not given. So it seems something that I should tackle at this point in my career. But I don't have a laboratory and <laughs> my various leadership roles have excavated my uh, ability to do more than lead uh, consortia. <laughs> uh, uh, lastly, I just want to point out that we are still working in Uganda. And this is uh, Prof. Moses Jaloba, who is a case student. He got his master's degree and PhD degree with Phil Rather. And he's turning over the deanship of the School of Biomedical Sciences at McCurry University to David Katiti who's an outstanding investigator. So we're still working in Uganda and talking about intensive studies. We've come up with multiple overlapping sources of funding and we will have a thousand household contacts. They'll have CT scans, they'll all have CT scans. They'll all have uh, auscultation with a special stethoscope. They'll all have biomarker studies and we'll be able to determine whether the um, our signature for progression really works or not. And also whether the strain matters in terms of risk of progression and disease. Uh, we built in studies of point of care ultrasound, uh, et, et cetera. So this is enormous and ongoing. And it's one of the things that keeps my hand in. So my peroration, I took this photograph from my, my home and I think it's symbolic of, you have to be optimistic if you're going to uh, become an infectious disease clinician or academician, you have to be bold. The collaborative research began in 1987 and it goes on. I've got great collaborators at Rutgers and Chris Whalen is with us again, but TB, has done extremely well. And in addition to tuberculosis, Bob and Michael have developed the HIV program in Uganda to the point that we have, they have an ACTG there. I think there's a big cardiology program, thanks to Bob. So what began small ended up being great and sustaining and Chuck, pulled back from leadership. I pulled back from leadership, but we train great people and the work's going on. And lastly, thanks to Chuck for nurturing an environment in which excellence in clinical care and research and addressing the issues of the underserved beckons. And that really is the goal of the end of the rainbow that was Chuck Carpenter. So thank you. Very, very great, Jerry. Thank you very much. For those of you that have questions, we're going to pass around the microphone, and if you could identify yourself, because uh, you may, Jerry may not know you, but that would be great. We're going to start with John Johnson first, because Jerry mentioned him several times during the presentation. Uh, John, do you have additional comments to make? I've spent a lot of my career working on treatment shortening, but you know the role of post-TB lung damage has become increasingly studied again. It was in the early 60s. 
Uh, and I think it's important to begin to look at ways treatments to modulate that through earlier diagnosis, treatment with better drugs and then with probably biologics or small molecules to modulate that response. So I wonder what you think the most promising areas, agents in that part of TB science is. Well, you know, I think there have been many studies of potential immunomodulators and host-directed therapy. Um, the, the problem has been the, the results are not clear cut. You know, the best of them may show, so show improvement in FEV1 and um, Friedrich, for example, is using PET-CT as an endpoint. And this makes sense to see if you really deal with the inflammation. We did some work with comparing host-directed therapies and the leading cabinets, but, candidates, by the way, are metformin as well as some Vastin. We found the only thing that really worked well in it mouse models, rapamycin. And of course, there's reluctance to put that in human population. So it's not easy to modify the inflammatory response safely. But I think, you know, almost because of, we have to look at the upside, but I'm going to digress. So Ken Mayer, who was at Brown with Chuck, now is at Harvard, wrote an article in Boston Globe saying that his career is bookended by HIV and COVID. And mine was, and yours was. And, but when these things happened, there's suddenly a lot more discovery, a lot more companies come in with vaccines, et cetera, and molecules to modify the inflammatory response and prevent or treat long uh, COVID. So it's my hope because I don't see anything too promising out there among what we know is that other more, you know, molecules which work at more fundamental way directly on the inflammatory cascade may be useful. I don't know what it will be. While we're waiting for Michael, uh, I just want to point out, Jerry, that we are now funded to look at the evolving problem of lung cancer in both Uganda and Tanzania. And one of the cofactors that we're looking at very carefully is not only HIV, but also tuberculosis. And there's a great deal of prevalent TB and we think it's another important epidemiologic risk. But Michael has a point. Jerry, thank you, that was just great. And if I'm allowed, I'd like to ask you two questions. The first is, if you have a mycobacterium living inside a bone complex, is he pretending to be dead or is he metabolically active at all? Um, and the second question is, what is a special stethoscope? <laughs> uh, there's an AI stethoscope that uses artificial intelligence to, um, to interpret heart sounds. And it looks like just the bell is not connected to anything except through the web into some master large computer. So, and there's obviously commutated detection on chest x-rays, which will probably is as good as experienced radiologists now in, in diagnosis of tuberculosis. So what was your question? <laughs> so if, what's a mycobacterium yeah. doing in a gong complex? Is he metabolically active at all? Which would imply that he's susceptible to interventions of some sort, yeah. or is he pretending to be dead? Well, you know, one, one of the limitations of the research that we do is it's often NIH funded. So they give you five years, end of story. So it makes it difficult to do long-term studies. Now, fortunately in Brazil, we've been able to put together TBRU and ICIDA and other funding. So we have a long-term cohort. And because we do, David Alain was able to take bacteria from the time, from the index, case and sequence them, Just look at some SNPs. And then a secondary case occurs five years later, same organism, different SNPs. It allows you to look at mutational frequency slash replication. And you can't tell which is which, but they're obviously, maybe it doesn't matter. And what he finds is that within the first year, 
after exposure, there seems to be a lot of replication of organisms in the latent focus. And then there's a long period where there's not much. And then just before you reactivate, there's more replication. It leads me to wonder, and maybe John or someone could look into this, that maybe preventive therapy works best in the first year or two, and maybe it loses efficacy after that. It, it, it makes sense. But, but uh, so I think the evidence is that, you know, some people may have truly latent organisms within the first year, but usually there's some replication, either something bad happens or you're in some steady state. But I, I, I think it's more like HIV, where there's a low level constant replication. And I, I don't know whether in fact, I and I is only affected earlier or throughout, but it's a question that you, you can't really answer easily in humans. I'll have to ask my people, my friends who work in mice. No, the two questions. Yeah, we need those stethoscopes here. Uh, I also want to point out Jerry will be joining us for Journal Club for the residents coming, where we're going to talk about the new Duke's criteria for infective endocarditis. But uh, Jerry, we mentioned along the way that COVID has impacted all of us. What is the relationship in your mind between COVID and tuberculosis, including the long TB phenomena? Yeah. I mean, we were excited at first because we thought that um, recent infection with TB through um, modification of the innate immune response might be lead to heterologous protection. Um, and we're doing studies to, to look at that. I mean, you don't see much direct evidence that there's more susceptibility to TB. We don't see more tuberculosis cases as we did with HIV. There may be more subtle effects. But I think it's a really interesting question as to whether COVID may modify, may be a cofactor much as HIV was. And long-term progression. You should study that. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, I, I want to congratulate Bob and Michael and others because, you know, after a while, I can only think about tuberculosis. Uh, but the fact that you've been able to broaden the scientific base for the work in Uganda is essential because, you know, although TB is in front of our minds, you know, there's so many other unaddressed issues. And they may overlap. So congratulations for that. Any other questions? Charlie? Charlie Bark? Uh, uh, nice to meet you, Charlie. I, I put your name on the slide in case you came. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, Charlie Bark, um, I'm at Metro and run the TB clinic there. Um, I was wondering what you think about the TB test, whether it's quantifier on PPD reversion, and and you know, because there's sort of the the dogma that once you're once you're positive, you're always positive. And I regularly see people who who are who had treat you know preventive therapy a long time ago, and they're still positive. Do you think there's really meaning in 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 follow up testing in the uh, in "Quote unquote latent TB." That's very, very interesting. It, as you, as you know, there was a because you know TB. Uh, there, there was a, the BCG revaccination study showed that you didn't prevent aggregate conversion, but then those people reverted to negative. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, so we are doing a study in India where we're looking at aggregate conversion and reversion. But it's really kind of complicated. I mean, I've been impressed by the studies from Africa, which suggests that if you use a higher cut point for energy minus nil and agar, 0 0.70, then you really capture the people you need to worry about, because those are the people who are likely to, to progress. And we probably could do more by looking at titus of agaris. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure anyone will get around to doing that, but we probably could learn something from that. But I, I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that uh, 
that if you become argue negative, this is a good versus a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. I did want to call out Henry, who I think is in Uganda or somewhere, because he did this very important study in Uganda, which I think, you know, if I had room, I would have included it as a known unknown. But what he found, as you know, in the household contacts, who are argue negative, and remain argue negative for more than 10 years in Uganda, they, they actually may have been infected. They, they have T cells that produce cytokines, not agar, um, not interferon gamma. They have antibody switching, suggesting that they've been sensitized to TB. Now we know that the agar negative individuals in contacts are less likely to develop tuberculosis. I think that that's a population which may be protected. And, you know, Congratulations to Henry in absentia for that discovery. <laughs> and it needs to be studied more. That population, I think, is very interesting, potentially important. We can end up with I have one last comment or question from Robert Bonomo way in the back. Robert is doing some in vitro studies looking at old drugs that might work against TB. And what do you think, Robert? Actually, in a holodusa and uh, uh, in our lab is uh, spearheading that um, uh, we would uh, Jerry and I had this discussion maybe in 1995 why can't beta lactams be used against mycobacterial disease and um, the biochemistry is very supportive that they will work and um, we have some very interesting data that uh, shows that combination beta lactam therapy and even some of the new beta lactamase inhibitors, durolobactam, that was recently uh, uh, public, uh, recently released, is incredibly potent. And some of our fellows here actually won awards in our department for demonstrating that stuff. So I, I, I think the, the the story, the therapeutic story, is not over, Jerry. And uh, you know, I, I think we're at a very important threshold in this work. Thank you, Bob. I, I, I hope I include your name on that slide. <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, sir. So let's go ahead and wrap up. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And for a great presentation. Great.